Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to introduce the messenger lecturer, Professor Richard P. Feynman of the California Institute of Technology. Professor Feynman is a distinguished theoretical physicist, and he's done much to bring order out of the confusion, which has marked much of the spectacular development in physics during the post-war period. Among his honors and awards, I will mention only the Albert Einstein Award in 1954. This is an award which is made every third year, and which includes a gold medal and a substantial sum of money. Professor Feynman did his undergraduate work at MIT and his graduate work at Princeton. He worked on the Manhattan Project at Princeton and later at Los Alamos. He was appointed an assistant professor here at Cornell in 1944, although he did not assume residence until the end of the war. I thought it might be interesting to see what was said about him when he was appointed at Cornell, so I searched the minutes of our board of trustees. And there's absolutely no record of his appointment. <laughs> There are, however, some 20 references uh, to leaves of absence, uh, salary, and promotions. One reference interested me especially. On July 31, 1945, the chairman of the physics department wrote the dean of the arts college stating that Dr. Feynman is an outstanding teacher and investigator, the equal of whom develops infrequently. The <laughs> The chairman suggested that an annual salary of $3,000 was a bit too low for a distinguished faculty member <laughs> and recommended that Professor Feynman's salary be increased $900. <laughs> the dean, in an act of unusual generosity and with complete disregard for the solvency of the university, crossed out the $900 and made it an even thousand. <laughs> you can see that we thought highly of Professor Feynman even then. <laughs> Feynman took up residence here at the end of 1945 and spent five highly productive years on our faculty. He left Cornell in 1950 and went to Caltech, where he has been ever since. Before I let him talk, I want to tell you just a little bit more about him. Three or four years ago, he started teaching a beginning physics course at Caltech, and the result has added a new dimension to his fame. His lectures are now published in two volumes, and they represent a refreshing approach to the subject. In the preface of the published lectures, there's a picture of Feynman. <laughs> performing happily on the bongo drums. My Caltech friends tell me that he sometimes drops in on the Los Angeles night spots and takes over the work of the drummer, but Professor Feynman tells me that that's not so. Another of his specialties is safe cracking. <laughs> One legend says that he once opened a locked safe in a secret establishment, removed the secret document, and left a note saying, guess who? <laughs> I could tell you about the time that he learned Spanish before he went to give a series of lectures in Brazil, but I won't. <laughs> this, this, gives me enough, this gives you enough background, I think, so let me say that I'm delighted to welcome Professor Feynman back to Cornell. His general topic is the nature of physical law, and his topic for tonight is the law of gravitation, an example of physical law. Professor Feynman. It's odd, but in the infrequent occasions when I've been called upon in a formal place to play the bongo drums, the introducer never seems to find it necessary to mention that I also do theoretical physics. <laughs> I believe that's probably uh, that we respect the arts more than the sciences. The artists of the Renaissance said that man's main concern should be for man. And yet, uh, there are some other things of interest in the world. Even the artists appreciate sunsets and the ocean waves and the march of the stars across the heavens. And there is some reason then to talk of other things sometimes. As we look into these things, we get an aesthetic pleasure from them directly on observation. But there's also a rhythm and a pattern between the phenomena of nature, which isn't apparent to the eye, but only to the eye of uh, analysis. And it's these rhythms and patterns which we call physical laws. What I want to talk about in a series of lectures is the general characteristics of these physical laws. That's even another level, if you will, of higher generality over the laws themselves. And it's uh, really all I'm talking about is nature as seen as a result of detailed analysis. But only the 
most overall general qualities of nature is what I mainly wish to speak about. Now, such a topic has a tendency to become too philosophical because it becomes so general that uh, a person talks in such generalities that everybody can understand him, and it's considered to be some deep philosophy. If you, However, I would like to be very, rather more special, and I would like to be understood in an honest way rather than in a vague way to some extent. And so, if you don't mind, I'm going to try to give, instead of only the generalities, in this first lecture, an example of physical law so that you have at least one example of the things about which I am speaking generally. In this way, uh, I can use this example again and again to give an instance to make a reality out of something which would otherwise be too abstract. Now, I've chosen for my special example of physical law to tell you about the theory of gravitation, or the phenomenon of gravity. Why I chose gravity, I don't know. I had, whatever I chose, you would ask the same question. <laughs> Actually, it uh, was one of the first great laws to be discovered, and it has an interesting history. You may say yes, but then it's old hat. I would like to hear something about uh, science, more modern science. More recent, perhaps, but not more modern. Modern science is exactly in the same tradition as the discoveries of the law of gravitation. It is only more recent discoveries that we would be talking about. And so I have no, I do not feel at all bad about telling you of the law of gravitation because I am in describing its history and the methods, the character of its discovery and its quality, talking about modern science, completely modern. This law has been called the greatest generalization achieved by the human mind. And you can get already from the, my introduction, I'm more interested, not so much in the human mind, as in the marvel of nature who can obey such an elegant and simple law as this law of gravitation. So our main concentration will not be on how clever we are to have found it all out, <laughs> but on how clever she is to pay attention to it. <laughs> now, uh, what is this law of gravitation that we're going to talk about? The law is that uh, two bodies or bodies exert a force upon each other which is inversely as the square of the distance between them and varies directly as the product of their masses. And the mathematicians, mathematically, we can write that great law down in the formula, some kind of a constant times the product of the two masses divided by the square of the distance. Now, if I add the remark that a body reacts to a force by accelerating or by changing its velocity every second to an extent inversely as its mass, it, it reacts, uh, it changes velocity more if the mass is lower and so on, inversely as the mass, then I have said everything about the law of gravitation that needs to be said. Everything else is a consequence, a mathematical consequence of those two things that I said. That's a remarkable enough phenomenon in itself that the next lecture will consider this in more detail. Now, I know you're not all uh, here. I know some of you are, but you're not all mathematicians, and so you cannot all immediately see all of the consequences of these two remarks. And so what I would like to do in this lecture is to briefly tell you the story of the discovery, tell you what some of the consequences are, what the effect of this discovery had on the history of science, what kinds of mysteries such a law entails, something about the refinements made by Einstein, and uh, possibly the relation to other laws of physics. The history of the thing, uh, briefly, is this, that the ancients first observed the way the planets seemed to move about in the sky and concluded that they all went around, along with the Earth, went around the sun. This discovery was later con made independently by Copernicus, if they had forgotten that people had forgotten that it had already been made. Now, the next thing, question that came up in to study was exactly how do they go around the sun? That is, exactly what kind of motion? Do they go with the sun at the center of a circle or do they go in some other kind of a curve? How fast do they move and so on? And this discovery took a longer to make. The times after Copernicus were times in which there were great debates about whether the planets in fact went around the sun along with the earth or whether the earth was at the center of the universe and so on. And there were considerable arguments about this. When a man named Tycho Brahe got an idea of a, a way of answering the question, he thought that it might perhaps be a good idea to look very, very carefully and to record where the planets actually appear in the sky, and then the alternative theories might be distinguished from one another. This is the key of modern science and is the beginning of the true understanding of nature, this idea that to look at the thing, to record the, the details, and to hope that in the information thus obtained may lie a clue to one or another of a possible theoretical interpretation. So Tycho, who was a rich man and owned, I believe, an island near Copenhagen, outfitted his island with great brass circles and special observing positions, uh, situations, chairs that you could look through little holes, and recorded night after night the position of the planets. It's only through such hard work that we can find out anything. When these, all these data were collected, they came into the hands of Kepler, who then tried to analyze what kinds of motions the, the planets made around the sun. And uh, he did this by a method of trial and error. At one stage, he thought he had it. He, assumed, he figured out that they went around the sun in circles with the sun off center and noticed that one planet, I think it was Mars, but I don't know, uh, was eight minutes of arc off. And he decided this was too big for Tycho Brahe to have made an error. 
and that this was not the right answer. So because of the precision of experiments, he was able to proceed and find that, to go on to another trial, and found, in fact, ultimately this. Three things. First, that the planets went in ellipses around the sun with the sun at a focus. An ellipse is a curve you all artists know about because it's a foreshortened circle, or in children know about because somebody told them that if you take a string and tie it to two tacks and put a pencil in there, it'll make an ellipse. These two tacks are the foci, and if the sun is here, the shape of the orbit of a planet around the sun is one of these curves. The next question is, and going around the ellipse, how does it go? Does it go faster when it's near the sun, slower when it's further from the sun, and so on? We take away the other focus, we have the sun then and the planet going around. And Kepler found the answer to this too. He found this, that if you put the position of the planet down in two, at two times separated by some definite time, let's say uh, three weeks, and then at another place in the orbit, put the positions of the planets again separated by three weeks, and draw lines from the sun to the planet, technically called radius, radius vectors. But anyway, lines from the planet, sun to the planet, then the area that's enclosed in the orbit of the planet and the two lines that are separated by the planet's position three weeks apart is the same no matter what part of the orbit the thing is on. So that it has to go faster when it's closer in order to get the same area as it goes slower when it's further away and in this precise manner. Some several years later, he found the third rule and uh, that had not to do with the exactly of motion of a single planet around the sun but related the various planets to each other. And it said that the times that it took the planet to go all the way around was related to the size of the orbit and that the times went as the square root of the cube of the size of the orbit and for the size of the orbit is the diameter all the way across the biggest distance on the ellipse. So uh, he has these three laws which are summarized by saying it's an ellipse and that equal areas are swept in equal times and that the time to go around varies as a three half power of the size, the square root of the cube of the size. So there's three laws Kepler which is a very complete description of the motion of the planets around the sun. The next question was, what makes them go around? Well, how can we understand this in more detail? Or is there anything else to say? In the meantime, Galileo was investigating the laws of motion. Incidentally, at the time of uh, Kepler, the problem of what drove the planets around the sun was answered in some, in some, by some people by saying that there were angels behind here beating their wings and pushing the planet along around orbit. As we'll see that that answer is not very far from the truth, the only difference is that the angels sit in a different direction and the wings go in a different direction. <laughs> but the point that the angels sit in a different direction is the one that I must now come to. Galileo, in studying the laws of motion and doing a number of experiments to see how balls roll down inclined planes and pendulous swung and so on, discovered an idealization, a great principle called the principle of inertia, which is this. That if a thing has nothing acting on it, if an object has nothing acting on it and is going along at a certain velocity in a straight line, it will go at the same velocity at exactly the same straight line forever. Unbelievable though that may sound to anybody who has tried to make a ball roll forever, <laughs> the idealization did, is correct and that if there were no influences acting such as a friction on the floor and so on, the thing would go at a uniform speed forever. The next point was made by Newton, who discussed the next question, which is when it doesn't go in a straight line, then what? And he answered this way, that a force is needed to change the velocity in any manner. First, for instance, if you're pushing it in a direction that it moves, it will speed up. If you find that it changes direction, then the force that must have been sideways. And that the force can be measured by the product of two effects. First, how much does the velocity change in a small interval of time? How fast is the velocity changing? How much is it accelerating in this direction? Or how much is the velocity changing when it changes this direction? That's called the acceleration. And when that's multiplied by a coefficient called the mass of an object, or its inertia coefficient, then that together is the force. One can measure the, for instance, if one has a stone on the end of a string and swings it in a circle over his head, then one can measure, if one finds one has to pull, the reason is that the speed of this, the, the velocity, the speed is not changing as it goes around the circle, but it's changing its direction, so there must be perpetually an in-pulling force, and this uh, is proportional to the mass, so that if we were to take two different objects, first swing one, and then swing another one at the same speed around the head and measure the force in the second one, that second one, uh, the, the new force is bigger than the other force in the proportion that the masses are different. This is a way of measuring the masses, by how much, how hard it is to change the speed. Now, then Newton saw uh, from this, that for instance, to take a simple example, if a planet is going in a circle around the sun, no force is needed to make it go sideways tangentially, if there were no force at all on it, it would have just keep coasting this way. But actually, the planet doesn't keep coasting this way, but finds itself later, not out here where it would go if there were no force at all, but further down toward the, the sun. In other words, its velocity, its motion has been deflected toward the sun. 
So what the angels have to do is to beat their wings in toward the sun all the time. But the motion to keep it going in a straight line has no known reason. The reason why things coast forever has never been found out. The law of inertia is no known origin. So the angels don't exist, but the continuation of the motion does. But in order to obtain the falling operation, we do need a force. So it became apparent that the origin of that the force was toward the sun. As a matter of fact, Newton was able to demonstrate that the statement that equal areas are swept in equal times was a direct consequence of the simple idea that all of the changes in velocity are directed exactly to the sun, even in the elliptical case. And maybe I'll have time next time to show you how that works in detail. So from this law, he would confirm the idea that the force is toward the sun. And from knowing how the periods of the different planets vary with the distance away from the sun, it's possible to determine how that force must weaken at different distances, and he was able to determine that the force must vary inversely as a square of the distance. Now, so far, he hasn't said anything. Yes, because he only said two things which Kepler said in a different language. One is exactly equivalent to the statement that the force is toward the sun, and the other is exactly equivalent to the statement that the law is inversely as a square of the distance. But People had seen in telescopes that Jupiter's satellites going around Jupiter, and it looked like a little solar system. So the satellites were attracted to Jupiter. And the moon is attracted to the Earth, and this goes around the Earth, it's attracted the same way. So it looks like everything's attracted to everything else. And so the next statement was to generalize this and to say that every object attracts every other object. If so, the Earth must be pulling on the moon, just as the sun pulls on the planet. But it's known that the Earth pulls on things because you're all sitting tightly in your seats in spite of your desires to float out of the hall at this time. The pull of ob for objects on the Earth was well known in the phenomenon of gravitation. And it was Newton's idea then that maybe the gravitation which held the moon in the orbit also applied was the same gravitation that pulled the objects toward the Earth. Now it is easy to figure out how far the moon falls in one second. Because if it went in a straight line, you know the size of the orbit, you know it takes a month to go around. And if you figure out how far it goes in one second, you can figure out how far the circle of the moon's orbit has fallen below the straight line that it would have been in if it didn't go the way it does go. And this distance is 1 20th of an inch. Now the moon is 60 times as far away from the Earth's center than we are. We're 4,000 miles away from the center and the moon is 240,000 miles away from the center. So if the law of inverse square is right, an object at the Earth's surface should fall in one second by 1 20th of an inch times 3,600 being the square of 60 because the force has been weakened by 60 times 60 for the inverse square law in getting out there to the moon. And if you multiply a 20th of an inch by 3,600, you get about 16 feet. And lo, it is known already from Galileo's measurements that things fell in one second on the Earth's surface by 16 feet. So this mean, meant, you see, that he was on the right track. There was no going back now. <laughs> because a new fact that was completely independent previously, which is the period of the moon's orbit and its distance from the Earth, was connected to another fact, which is how long it takes something to fall in one second. So this was a dramatic test that everything's all right. Further, he had a lot of other predictions. He was able to calculate what the shape of the orbit should be if the law were the inverse square and found indeed that it was an ellipse. So he got three for two, as it were. In addition, a number of new phenomena had their uh, obvious explanations. One was the tides. The tides were due to the pull of the moon on the Earth. This had sometimes been thought of before with the difficulty that if it's the pull of the moon on the Earth, the Earth being here, the water's being pulled up to the moon, then there would only be one tide a day where that bump of water is under the moon. But actually, you know, there are tides every 12 hours, roughly, and that's two tides a day. But you must, there was also another school of thought that had a different conclusion. Their theory was that it was the Earth that was pulled by the moon away from the water. <laughs> so actually, Newton was the first one to realize what actually was going on, that the force of the moon on the Earth and on the water is the same at the same distance, and that the water here is closer to the moon, and the water here is further from the moon than the Earth than the rigid Earth, so that the water is pulled more toward the moon here, and here is less toward the moon than the Earth, so there's a combination of those two pictures that makes a double tide. Actually, the Earth uh, does the same trick as the moon. It goes around a circle, really. I mean, the force of the moon on the Earth is balanced, but by what? By the fact that just like the moon goes in a circle to balance the Earth's force, the Earth is also going in a circle. Actually, the center of the circle is somewhere inside the Earth. It's also going in a circle uh, to balance the moon. So the two of them go around a common center here. And if you wish, this water is thrown off by centrifugal force more than the Earth is, and this water is attracted more than this average of the Earth. At any rate, the tides were then explained, and the, the fact that there were two a day. A lot of other things became quite clear. Why the Earth is round? Because everything gets pulled in. And why it isn't round? Because it's spinning, so that the outside gets thrown out a little bit, and it balances. <laughs> and why the sun and moon are round, and so on. Now, as the science developed, and measurements were made ever more accurately, the tests of Newton's law became much more stringent. And the first careful tests involved the moons of Jupiter. 
by careful observations of the way they went around over a long period of time, one to be very careful to check that everything was according to Hort Newton. And <laughs> turned out not to be the case. The moons of Jupiter appeared to be first to uh, get sometimes to eight minutes ahead of time and sometimes eight minutes behind time schedule, where schedule is the calculated values according to Newton's laws. It was noticed that they were ahead of schedule when they were close, when New Jupiter was close to the Earth and behind schedule when it was far away, a rather odd circumstance. And Mr. Romer, having confidence in the law of gravitation, came to an interesting conclusion that it takes light some time to travel from the moons to the Earth, and that what we're looking at when we see the moons are not how they are now, but how they were the time ago that it took the light to get here. Now, when Jupiter's near us, it takes less time for the light to come, and when Jupiter's further, it takes longer time, so he had to correct the observations for the differences in time, and by the fact that they were this much too early or that much too late, was able to determine the velocity of light. This was the first demonstration that light was not an instantaneously propagating material. I bring this particular matter to your attention because it illustrates something. That when a law is right, it can be used to find another one. That by having confidence in this law, if something is a matter, it suggests perhaps some other phenomenon. And if we had not known the law of gravitation, we would have taken much longer to find the speed of light because we would not have known what to expect of Jupiter's satellites. This process has developed into an avalanche of discoveries. Each new discovery permits the tools for much more discovery, and this, uh, begin this is the beginning of that avalanche, which has gone on now for 400 years in a continuous process, and we're still avalanching along at high speed at this time.